Hello and welcome to our live stream today. My name is Peggy Cornett. I'm curator of plants at Monticello and I'm here with um, our friend <laughs> in not in costume today, but no, Bill Barker, not in the persona of Mr. Jefferson, uh, thank heaven, because I have a lot to learn in, in what I do from this lady right here, Peggy Cornett, in my opinion, who knows more about uh, the, the flowers and vegetables and the plantings and about Monticello and elsewhere than anyone else I know. Well, thank you. Well, Peggy. we're going to talk about Jefferson's garden book today. And so this is a, uh, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we were just discussing earlier about uh, the, the, the actual garden book that we, we use today. And I first got my copy. This is my old copy that I got in 1979. This is the 1974 edition. But what we're looking at is the, um, what's called the Th Thomas Jefferson's garden book that was edited by Edwin Betts in 1944. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Jefferson's actual garden book is quite different. But I'll also mention that since this publication, we did a reprint, and this is what you can find today, um, which is a, a reprint from 2012 of the um, 1944 edition. It has an introduction by uh, Peter Hatch, uh, Director Emeritus of Gardens and Grounds. So this is a, a very pretty copy, and this is a, 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 an original painting of the Jeffersonian by Philip the Twinleaf, named after Thomas Jefferson on the cover. But um, we're going to talk a bit about the, the actual, the original garden book that Jefferson had, which was a diary. And he started uh, keeping this diary in 1766 when he was 23. Yeah. <clears throat> and he was not even living at Monticello. He was living at uh, his, his boyhood home, Shadwell. And um, the, the original book is, is we can show a, uh, maybe an image of it, um, because it's housed, it, the original book is housed in the Massachusetts Historical Society in, Mass in Boston, uh, Massachusetts. And actually I had the honor of visiting the original book. Um, they let me put gloves on and I could thumb through it. And it's only about 66 pages. And um, uh, it's, it's a leather bound book. Um, you can show the next slide that'll show, it's, it's sort of a, a worn out version of what of you would, of a kind of journal you might have for your own garden. Uh, today and Jefferson didn't even fill it up. It probably had twice as many page blank pages as pages that were written on. Um, but he kept this journal um, from the time when, when he was living at Shadwell, age 23, until two years before his death in 1824. Yeah, and, and as you pointed out with the various editions of the garden mm -hmm. books that you have, mm -hmm. I as well, uh, the second printing of the 1944 uh, edition and or first printing and uh, I've had mine not quite as long but nearly I, I write in uh, my books uh, where I bought them and was given this is from uh, a former librarian at the American Philosophical Society Roy Goodman uh, who gifted me this in 1991 wow. and what you see as with Peggy's and mine how thick they are in their successive reprints and editions. And Peggy, you were just mentioning that the original garden book that Jefferson had, and one wonders whether he might have actually bound this himself or had it created as a blank book in Williamsburg by the printers there. Very possible. Yeah. That's right. So how do they continue to differ in their reprints? Well, the edition that uh, Edwin Betts um, edited and published. It was published, it was supposed to be published in 1943, which would have been the 200th anniversary of Jefferson's birth. Right. But I think there was a w World War II going on or something then that, that caused some problems with um, publications. So um, it came out in 1944. But what Edwin Betts did, he was a body professor at the uh, University of Virginia and uh, the Garden Club of Virginia uh, ladies actually solicited his um, his work to do the research. And so he, he created a, a book that's over 600 pages, really, out of the 60 pages of Jefferson's Garden Diary. But he does it by uh, each year, including everything that was ever, Jefferson ever wrote about gardening, you know, excerpts from letters, uh, memoranda to overseers and gardeners. And um, so every year has 
it has a lot of information about what was happening to Jefferson in his lifetime during that, that time period. Mm. In some years, Jefferson actually skipped. There are several years where he didn't even write in his garden book. So Betts will um, include material from that year of what was going on in Jefferson's lifetime. And the other thing that Edwin Betts did was to pull from Jefferson's memoranda books. So he had a, a memoranda books that where he wrote down um, a, like the accounting book that where he wrote down everything he spent spent money on. So he was um, actually buying plants, for example, and Edwin Betts would include it in this book. Um, and uh, there was a weather mem memorandum book that he included if it had something to do with the gardens. So this, um, and then at the end of this book, it's really, really a wonderful book to have. Um, at the very end of it, he includes in the appendices um, uh, the chapter out of Jefferson's only published book, Notes on the State of Virginia, which um, includes all, all the plants that Jefferson was recording. And here we have a lot of native plants um, that he did, um, organized either by medicinally, um, uh, ornamental, uh, useful for fabrication or um, uh, uh, useful for um, uh, cooking, culinary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there were four different categories. And um, so when you're referring to uh, plants for medicinal purposes, he's entering at that time, is he not, uh, the planting of, um, of digitalis, uh, the well, foxglove. Well, he, yeah. he includes, yeah, there are certain uh, things like um, the, the black cohosh. Uh, it's still considered a medicinal plant, and that's included in the notes on the state of Virginia. And mm. it's a wonderful native plant that grows in our woodlands here quite plentifully. Mm. But we could show a couple more images here, and I can talk more about, um, uh, the, of course, here, this is a Ravana River. Uh, across the other side is where Jefferson's boyhood home was located, Chadwell. And um, if we go on, we'll see the first page of the, the garden book, which... Um, uh, he lists Shadwell at the top, and um, it's quite lovely. Uh, when I think, of, I, I really spent a lot of time going back to this, these first few pages of the garden book, especially this page, which was written um, in, in this, began in the spring of 1766. He was noticing uh, flowers in the garden, and we don't know very much about that ornamental garden at Shadwell. I've, you know, talked to the archaeologist, Susan, Susan Kern, and she said they never really found the evidence of it, but he must have been there. And um, the, what, mostly what we know is from the garden book, what Jefferson wrote. So he's, he's looking at um, daffodils, uh, narcissus, um, native plant, plants along the Ravana River. Uh, but what I find so interesting too is that he, he began this page or this uh, year, this spring, the, the spring after his, his oldest sister died. Oh. And, it, and to me, I feel like it was maybe a, a a way for him to remember her and what they shared, because apparently they did enjoy sharing um, uh, flowers and gardens and their love of, of flowers. Okay. And Jefferson once wrote that um, the only way to recover from sadness is, is time and silence. Time and silence. And mm -hmm. um, so uh, I feel like that was a way. If we move forward, you'll see some pictures. Um, the next slide of, of the hyacinth. Uh, I sort of zoom in there, Hyacinth begins to bloom. And, and so this was even before he was his birthday, which would have been April 13th. Yeah. Now, April 13th, he's writing about the bacoon flower. So we'll move forward a couple, couple of images here. Um, and you see there's uh, the type of hyacinths, uh, the, uh, uh, the Roman hyacinths that were very popular along, still growing along old home sites today. And, and then the bacoon, which is a wildflower, a native plant, that's a, a, a Native American name for the blood root, and um, it's it's really a, it was used for uh, medicinal purposes. It's a root, and uh, it's a beautiful plant, though. Um, if, when you see it in bloom, um, which the next image shows you, uh, we actually grow it here in the gardens mm. today, and um, it's only a, a, in bloom for a very short period of time in in um, late March and April. But as you can see, this when the sun hits those flowers, yeah. they just open up. So lovely, and it must have been beautiful when Jefferson would see them in the woodlands in the along woods. the Ravana River. So vibrant, so yeah. vibrant. My and head. the next flower that I, I included here is the um, <clears throat> is the plant that he said, a bluish colored foam form flower in the low ground, in bloom. 
That's what he wrote in the garden book. He didn't write the name of this because he didn't know the name of it, <laughs> but we know the name mm -hmm. of it. It has to be this plant, which is the our Virginia bluebell, Blue the Mertensia virginica. And so he's he's um, observing some today, of course, we have wildflower walks in the spring and we hope to have them again. Uh, we did a video of our, our, of our uh, Bluebell Valley, we call it. Um, you can show the close up of the flower in the next image. Um, and uh, there wow, it is, so beautiful. And beautiful. you can see the bluish colored funnel form mm -hmm. flower. <laughs> How mm -hmm. well, so, but of course, Jefferson did know a lot about native plants and um, uh, throughout the garden book, he's using um, a lot of Latin, uh, you know, botanical sure. Latin when he's talking about plants as well. And so from his youth all the way through his life, you know, mm -hmm. not a blade of grass grows uninteresting to me, that uh, innate curiosity in nature. Yeah. And also, Peggy, you've been so kind of yeah. bring us here today uh, examples of what Jefferson was planting in his garden at Shadwell as early as 1766. And yet these are not indigenous to Virginia. No, that's right. They're, they're, um, they're ornamental flowers, but they were um, documented and illustrated in, in herbals as back as, as early as the 1500s. Mm. And we, you were saying that, you, well, you know, he could definitely have seen these in Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. um, so we have the globe amaranth. And when you see the historic images of them, we'll see the white, the pink and the magenta, which is um, the, still the colors that we have in the garden today. And we save these year after year. And then he also mentions coxcomb, which is this very curious amaranth. They're both members of the amaranthus family. Mm -hmm. And the thing I also find fascinating about those early pages in the garden book is that um, about over 30 different species are listed of flowers that we grow in the gardens today that really mm -hmm. are the mainstay of our summer gardens um, at, at Monticello. And some of these, are, are only mentioned once in those first couple of years. So. And, you know, the interesting thing, too, is Jefferson uh, certainly would have seen these cultivated in the gardens of the governor's palace, the uh, royal governor's palace in Williamsburg, when he arrives there uh, as a young man, just shy of, uh, of 17 years old, to attend William and Mary, the right. winter of 59 and 60. Uh, these would have been planted in the governor's palace gardens, the Costco and the Globe Amaranth. But he may have also seen them planted at, say, Shirley Plantation or Tuckahoe. Berkeley, Westover, Tuckahoe. Yeah. Absolutely, mm -hmm. is in those gardens. Yeah, they were. Uh, we have, might have a question here. We do. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Chester asks, "Do we know if Jefferson's wife was interested in gardening?" Oh, well, mm -hmm. that's interesting. Um, I think that they did have. They shared. Of course, we don't have much documentation on that, but um, when we get to, um, actually, if you look forward a little bit, a uh, few pages in, um, well, it's going to be, that's the first page when uh, Jefferson writes the word Monticello is in his garden book. I think that's pretty significant. Yeah. And he's talking about pea planting here, but we can go forward and maybe come back. But I wanted to show um, in 1782, when Jefferson's wife was, mm. um, uh, her health was, declining after the birth of their sixth child. Nice. He, was, he was keeping this um, diary um, in his garden book, um, observing the, the flowering period of different flowers. So we have the narcissus and the, uh, ro the dwarf roses and peonies. And, they, and he's charting their, their flowering periods all the way through the time when her health was declining. Mm -hmm. So I, to me, you know, we don't have, we don't, have any documentation on this other than what we can surmise that it might have been a shared activity um, as she was in the, in the house. Yeah, yeah, so well said, Peggy. I mean, all we can do is conjecture, uh, mm -hmm. knowing that Jefferson referred to the 10 short years they were married as 10 years of uncheckered happiness. Mm -hmm. It uh, nearly leads one to, to think they must have been soulmates in so many ways. And I think uh, uh, an appreciation of nature, in particular flowers and, and in gardening, was something they shared as well. And you're right, we'll never know. And this is so telling that as her health becomes so crucial, and of course, this was the birth of their last child, sixth child, they named Lucy Elizabeth. Uh, as that occurs in May, as you can see from the chart, uh, coming into July, August, it's blank. And, okay. and that's when she's so ill for those many, many weeks. Mm -hmm. 
She passes away September 6, 1782, and you see September and October are as well blank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I just feel like there's a real significance in, the, in that particular chart uh, from that year. And it's a great question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and of course, we, we want to go on to other parts of the garden book where he's um, talking about the vegetables and, and um, early on when they were planting um, vegetables on the hillside here before the vegetable garden terrace was, was established. Jefferson was, was, was mentioning um, sowing, uh, it was always beginning his, his garden book every spring by the big first planting of peas. Mm. And so, um, uh, and of course later in later years, the pea contest became a, oh, a real right. thing. <laughs> George Divers at Farmington and, and Mr. Jefferson here at uh, Monticello. And then there must've been other farmers in, in the, the area that were engaged. Yeah. And who can cultivate the first batch of peas early in the season, which can fall sometimes in the middle of February, or certainly towards the end of February, let alone the well, beginning Well, he'd start planting in February. February. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the pea is so fascinating to him and to divers and so many varieties? That's a good, good question. <laughs> but whoever brought the first dish of peas would have to have the whole neighborhood over for, right. for a meal. And um, Jefferson won at one time, but he didn't tell anybody because I think George Divers was really an excellent uh, farmer, apparently, and uh, he, he would always win it, so yeah, you have to win at that, too. <laughs> but, you know, there are, of course, uh, we know a lot, uh, no, not a whole lot, but we do get glimpses of Jefferson's um, interactions with the enslaved here at Monticello mm -hmm. through the garden book. Um, he lists um, uh, planting, for example, with uh, Wormley, who Wormley now Hughes. knows Wormley Hughes. Yeah. In the garden book, we, you know, he's only referencing um, the enslaved by their first names because um, I think really a lot of their, their surnames were sorted out by the um, getting word. Getting word, the, thank uh, heaven in mm -hmm. time, has been able to discover their mm -hmm. surnames and, and begin to uh, link all the different families uh, together mm -hmm. to our uh, great enlightenment and good fortune on that. So, But Jefferson does certainly refer to the individual uh, exactly. enslaved in, uh, who were uh, not just, you know, in the flowers, but also the vegetable garden was very important. And, uh, and then um, um, many of the enslaved were uh, for trans transporting um, vegetables and seeds and plants from places like from Washington to Monticello and Monticello to Poplar Forest, um, digging bulbs, that sort of thing. So these are all recorded in the garden book as well, which, mm. uh, you know, it, it's a, a story that's still not always pulled together as well as we'd like, but it's, it's definitely, definitely there. Mm -hmm. Another question, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, we've had a, lots of questions today. So I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Chester had asked about whether or not they used flowers inside, for example, as centerpieces. And Natalia also asked, did Jefferson change the decoration of Monticello using flowers or plants? So is there anything you can talk about with decorating with plants or... Well, we don't know much about, um, uh, for example, flower arranging in the house. Uh, we don't believe that was, was really a thing, unless his daughter, granddaughters were bringing plants in. We do have references to growing uh, the cypress vine in pots and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then there was a greenhouse that Jefferson had, that where, but he was basically right. just wanting plants that were fragrant, um, like the acacia and the, and the citrus. Um, but yeah, we don't know about decorating, but uh, the, 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 the ornamental garden was really outside. So um, he never called the West Lawn the back of the house, for example. That was the garden front yeah. and the east front was the entrance. But, um, but yeah, I think decorating, um, it's a little different, I think. Um, and we, we just don't have the documentation to know beautiful flower arrangements, but... There is mention of bouquets in some of the yeah, letters, that's true. so, so they're yeah. bouquets, but how are they Probably being those. presented? Hand, are they... hand flowers, they call them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. that's such a good question, yeah. Chester. I know you've been with us in many of these live streams, and that just gets us thinking on these subjects. Well, it's something we've always been wanting to confirm yeah. or deny, that's you know. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> so, yeah. And um, also, if, as, as we go through, maybe we can show a couple more pages of the garden book here. Um, that's showing the flowers that were mentioned in 1782, but I think I go on to um, talk about the layout of, oh, well, in 1794, Jefferson 
returns to Monticello after living, there was a lot, there had been a few years where he hadn't written in the garden book. Uh, but then when he returns from Philadelphia, he was, uh, he thought he was retiring at that. That was it. Resigned was, as Secretary of State. <laughs> done. Yeah. He thought. And, yeah. Yeah. And he, he wanted to become an ardent farmer. <laughs> and, um, but he, this was a, the most comprehensive list of, of herbs in the garden. So many people want to know about herbs and, and if you have an herb garden. And he did have uh, herb, we, we think they were in rows in the garden. They weren't really segregated into a knot garden or anything like that. But this has about a dozen or so um, primary herbs, just the basic, you know, rosemary and um, sage and uh, also uh, things like onions and that sort of thing are, are included on this list. But it's the one I always go to when I get the question about the herbs in the garden. So it's an important page. And notice how he does have it in columns again. He's starting to to um, use that kind of method of um, of documenting. Yeah, and then you think too. I mean, this is after he's been to France, so he's exactly. coming back with the delectable recipes de la France, and and here employing it. I think in many a. Uh, uh, exactly. Uh, uh, cultivation of French recipes with a lot of things these like herbs. the French tarragon was a going, very important yeah. herb in the garden and uh, his favorite, apparently. <laughs> mm. um, and uh, maybe we move on to a couple more images here of uh, oh, that's just a close up of those herbs uh, that I mentioned are herbs. You might say herbs. <laughs> but the vegetable garden um, in 1809, that's when we get a huge um, amount of of uh, documentation or, or of Jefferson's written documentation in the garden book on um, his retirement year. 1809, the vegetable garden is completed. Um, it has been excavated and leveled as a terrace by um, enslaved uh, laborers who were actually leased or, or brought here from mm -hmm. Fredericksburg. Seven to nine people, mm -hmm. men came here. And they uh, spent about three years uh, creating this, this terrace. Thousand feet long, eighty feet wide, and hmm. so this beautiful photograph from uh, uh, Robert Llewellyn's photograph of the vegetable garden, I think, is just an iconic picture, showing um, the, the the peak season of the vegetable garden during the summer. You have the, the, the beans and rows of, of vegetables um, all coming in, and um, Jefferson's list, which um, if we show the next image, we'll see. This, to, you know, people like to say it's like an Excel spreadsheet, but it's really remarkable because this was his first garden calendar in the garden book, and it's spelled with a K, a garden calendar. <laughs> and um, the, the columns are fascinating because they, he lists each of the vegetables or herbs, uh, when they were planted, um, when they, they came to table. That's my favorite, Can't come to table is what he wrote in the column. And, but there was a listing of failures. Um, and there may be a lot of reason for, you know, this is just one page of that 1809 garden. So there were many more vegetables and planted uh, than what you see on this page. And so, and they, and they weren't all failures. So this is kind of an indictment, but uh, mm. I think there was, the, uh, overall the successes outweighed the, the failures. But, um, but I think uh, it's, it, the, and these calendars are, and recorded from from 1809 all the way to 1824, the year that mm -hmm. the last year that Jefferson uh, wrote in the garden. And of book. course, he believed in planting an overabundance because he said, "You know, you're going to have a failure." Well, yeah, so <laughs> the failure of one thing is repaired by the success yes, of another. <laughs> uh, we have another question. We do. Ken asks, "Do you believe that any of the garden plants were used for medicinal?" or nourishment purposes as taught by the local Native Americans? Mm. Um, you know, it, it, that's very possible because um, we, we know he, he drank like herb, uh, I think um, mint teas mint for his, yeah, his uh, indigestion, that sort of thing. And um, that we know that the um, Meriwether Lewis's mother uh, was a, an herbalist yeah. and she uh, studied the medicinal uses. I don't know if Jefferson, you know, knew much from her, but um, uh, the medicinal uses of the Native American plants. Um, mm -hmm. So we're not sure, um, but I don't think much. We we kind of believe that Jefferson relied on his physicians, physicians for um, for um, uh, medicinal purposes, yeah. um, medicines. But um, do you, do you know much more about? No, that? but yeah. you're right about. And Mrs. Lewis, Lucy Merriweather, and yeah. she was of a family originally seated here. 
you know, Just in acquiring the land and patents, yeah, from the natives in, in many respects. Mm. Uh, also, too, you know, uh, we forget that tobacco was introduced by the natives to the Europeans uh, mm -hmm. for medicinal purposes, right. uh, to cleanse uh, uh, the, the body of ill health. It was actually believed to purify the body taken sparingly, yeah. uh, as well to elevate the mind. So that's something. A peace pipe. <laughs> peace pipe. Yeah. Revere it. Don't abuse it. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything in moderation. I mean, that just comes through all the time when we talk about Jefferson. By the way, Peggy, we, we've been focusing on the garden book, and rightly so, but he also kept a farm book. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and how do they essentially differ? Do they go back and forth with some of the Well, entries? some of the excerpts of the farm book are included in the garden book, but the farm book was more really talking about the, the, uh, the farm planting, and it also includes many listing of the enslaved, of, of you know, where they were where they were located, you know, like at Lego or, or um, Tufton or Shadwell. So it was a listing of names. And, and then also of, um, you know, uh, the, for the farm, he was doing some inter innovative crop rotation and that sort of thing. So, and uh, the use of um, things like a plaster, which would be like a, a lime to improve the soil and, um, and uh, uh, they even they even use tobacco leaves as a dressing, mm -hmm. I think, as a mulch, and also maybe as an insect repellent, yeah. which was kind of interesting. So, yeah. yeah. We have a question from Daniel. He's curious of, as to the fig varieties that were grown, oh, and are any of them still here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, Jefferson um, sent uh, the Marseille fig back from France. And that's a kind of a white fleshed fig. Um, it's green skinned and, and a white fig. And he thought that was the best. <laughs> but um, we have others. We don't believe, well, no, the figs that we have in the planted below the vegetable garden wall today are replanted varieties. They're not original figs. Unfortunately, we wish they're, they do live a long time. Um, yeah. So uh, we have the different varieties. We have the Angelique, Marseille, Brunswick, Brown turkey, brown turkey, and which is a, a very popular one today, and um, uh, and figs were. Um, we know that um, Jefferson shared figs with um, uh, uh, General uh, John Hartwell Cock yeah. down at, at Bremo, and Bremo. He uh, General Cock actually sent one of his enslaved um, gardeners to come to Monticello and to get the plants of Marseille fig. And we have, there's documentation of that. And for a time, we thought maybe that there were still Marseille figs there, but we're just we're just not oh, we, sure. There there are figs there, but mm -hmm. but uh, uh, they do live a long time and they sucker. So there, it's possible. That and there they are, are original figs. <laughs> yeah, <I love> <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> delicious. And, and, and they have to be protected a bit, but they do do pretty well here in Virginia. You know, too talking about where Jefferson is enjoying. Uh, either vegetables or, or fruits and, and the kind. He also enters into his garden book early on where he's enjoying a peas uh, or he's enjoying strawberries. And I mention this only because uh, as he's going back and forth to Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, as a student at William & Mary, later reading law and then beginning the practice of law, he, he is stopping at some of those uh, James River plantations, uh, Berkeley Plantation, Westover, Shirley, Mm -hmm. And he enters that he enjoys peas at Barclay, B-A-R-C-L-A-Y, which is Berkeley Plantation, right. Barclay. And then he enjoys strawberries at Dr. Rickman's, William Rickman, oh, my. Who, who became the Surgeon General of, of our Continental Troops and lived at what was called Milford uh, Plantation oh. there in Charles City County and uh, later became Kittywan Plantation. <laughs> and, and it's open to a, the public by appointment, but that's Rickman's original house, the original interior and paneling where Jefferson enjoyed strawberries as he entered into his garden. Well, he was also visiting uh, Green Spring. Yeah. And uh, that's where he got the acacias originally from, uh, the, 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 which is really a kind of a, a, a tender tree. It's not hardy outside. And so uh, his first acacias came from Greenspring. Greenspring. <laughs> so there's a lot of plant exchange going on. Um, Pass along plants, we would call it a day. But yeah, the, that's how he got things. I mean, of course, we were talking earlier about 1806 when Jefferson got a copy of the, of the 
the, the American gardener's calendar from his garden mentor, we might say, Bernard McMahon, who yeah. was out of Philadelphia. And so there's a lot of documentation uh, beginning in 1806 um, on where Jefferson is receiving uh, plant seeds and bulbs, or what they would say, uh, roots from Bernard McMahon. My. And um, really, these these letters exchanges are included in the best version of the garden book. Yeah. So Jefferson is at, he's giving credit to to those where he is either experiencing uh, um, a plant or, or food for the first time, mm -hmm. and let alone from whom he is uh, importing or, right. or sending plants out. Well, there's so much in here. I mean, I, I just pick it up sometimes the garden book and just look at a page and. I was open something. I don't know if I'll open to the right page, but he's talking about, um, I guess I won't, but anyway, <laughs> he's talking about um, the weather and in the garden book. And he's talking about um, different people in the area were, were recording the highest temperatures. And there was like 96 and 99 was the highest temperature ever recorded in Virginia is what he's writing. And at that same time, I forget what year it was now. He, he was, he knew about a hurricane that was hitting, oh. um, of Virginia, Charles City, Virginia. And so, you know, here we are, we're, hurricanes coming in um, oh, yeah. south, and uh, but but they were aware of hurricanes, even inland, I guess, um, in Jefferson's day. And he was recording that in his garden book. Too. And the greatest snowstorm that they, they knew to have hit Virginia at the time of his wedding. That's right. Uh, January of 1782. And then the great flood, we were referring to that recently in a live stream. Uh, mm, that was yes. May 1771. It destroyed mm -hmm. uh, his father's mill. That's right. And the mill dam. Yeah, the mill um, the greatest flood washed they away. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Another question. Oh, we have lots of questions today. People so are happy. really interested yeah. in this topic. <laughs> um, Natalia wonders if Jefferson had to buy vegetables from other plantations or was Monticello self-sufficient? Well, we know that the Jefferson family, uh, especially the granddaughter, was buying vegetables from the enslaved That's who right. had their own gardens here. Um, they had uh, uh, different plots in different mm -hmm. areas around the mountain, and they were um, kind of negotiating with the Jefferson household um, to, especially uh, produce that was out of season, you know, uh, and, and lots of uh, big quantities of cabbages and, and cucumbers and things like that, potatoes and eggs and so um, I don't think he was really purchasing from other neighboring plantations that I'm aware of too it much. It would have been more barter, wouldn't it? The, he was receiving seeds, for example, from um, George Divers was helping him replenish when they would lose um, crops uh, in the vegetable garden. They didn't save enough seed. Um, he would look to his neighbors, like especially Divers, who was saving seed of, of vegetables that... Mm. Um, that he he lost. It this happens all the time. Still happens to us. You know, oh. you have crop failures. You don't get a, 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 a season of seed, and so you've got to rely either on the store that you saved from the year before, or you look for other other sources. The plight of farming. That's it's right. The plight of farming. You're right. at the mercy of You're the, at the, mercy of the of weather and, and, and yeah. mold and everything. Mm. <laughs> Insects, mice. You bet. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Did you have another question? Um, I've got one more question here from Daniel again. Um, he wants to use inspirations from Monticello Gardens for his own garden. So mm -hmm. he wonders if you could recommend a book for that or maybe talk a little bit about how he could even get some seeds or plants from Monticello. Well, we do. Um, yeah, of course, we're, we're kind of pushing it. I mean, this is available on our on our website, of course, but you can also go to our website and there's just lots of information about the gardens um, and uh, we offer seeds that are actually collected from the gardens here. Those are uh, easy to, to purchase from the year round. Um, plants are available as well, but there's a lot of, uh, there's also a little short videos about gardening on our website. If you just search around <laughs> um, and look at through the different topics and um, you'll, you'll find a lot of good information there that we've been kind of accumulating and adding to our, our uh, uh, website. Um, so that's that's a good, easy way that you can just... And, and Daniel, first and foremost, uh, come to Monticello and, and take a go. garden <laughs> tour with Peggy Cornett. There's the inspiration. I assure you that, let alone come for uh, come special and... occasions and sessions where Peggy is giving lectures and talk yeah. on, on gardening. Well, we have we have regular garden tours here all the way through the end of October. And uh, 
So there, there's a, the guides have a wealth of information as well. So um, if you're in, I don't know where you live, but if you live near uh, Monticello or come to visit, um, it's a great time, even in the winter. I mean, I love being in the gardens in the winter. You get a, a real sense of, of the landscape, the views, um, uh, kind of the... Peggy, through, through the years that you have been to help um, create the beauty that are the gardens and the vegetable gardens, et cetera, here at Monticello, what, what remains your, your greatest fascination and interest uh, in the work that is being done here horticulturally? Well, it's, it's just always a, a, such a pleasure to come here. And, um, uh, you know, I have to kind of remind myself how, how special it is. Um, and I, <clears throat> I've been doing a lot of uh, just look uh, research into the, the flowers in recent, uh, last, for the past year, I've been trying to accumulate a lot of our knowledge that we've, we've gained over the years on, on the flowers and bringing it into more focus. But um, just, you know, the fact that we've been able to, to um, build this um, collection yeah. of seeds and plants um, for the, you know, for the many years I've been here is uh, to me a, a, a really very special, I think. And the fact that we can share our information with other, other friends of Monticello, other historic sites. Um, so there's a, there's a great community, I think, of, of garden historians that are preserving um, all that we're, we're growing here as well. And I think, you know, just trying to bring this to the future, I think it's very important. Um, um, you know, gardening is just really a living history uh, in a sense that it's bringing history forward through, through the changing of gardens. I've seen a lot of changes here with trees coming and going and, oh. and I have a great fascination for trees too. Yeah. So uh, anyway, but yeah. And I, I think also, Peggy, you bring an intimacy and acquaintance with the garden here and with the individual flowers, let alone the trees that is so mm -hmm. special unto Monticello's gardens, it, the intimacy of it, the special location of this little mountain and the, the variety of terrain in 360 degrees. I, you, you, you make that. Well, and I think I share a love of plants similar to Jefferson. I'm kind of, I'm just a plant nut basically. So, mm -hmm. and I think he just had a real interest, fascination with all kinds of plants. And it, he seemed to want to gather them, bring them in Monticello. And um, he was always looking for new, interesting mm -hmm. plants. Yeah. So. so thank you. <laughs> thank you for being with us. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, it, was, it was a real pleasure. Always. I can't, I can't tell you. <laughs> thank you. My pleasure.